So thanks for inviting me here to speak to you. I'm happy to talk to you about therapeutic drug monitoring and personalized medicine. So by the end of my talk today, hopefully you will be able to list key conditions needed before therapeutic drug monitoring can be routinely performed, describe clinical situations where therapeutic drug monitoring should be considered, and be able to discuss relevant literature on the relationship of drug concentrations to efficacy and toxicity of oncology and HIV therapies. So adverse drug reactions are actually a very big deal. And so in 1994, the adverse drug reactions accounted for over 2 million serious events a year and accounted for 106,000 deaths, uh, which was about 5% of all deaths. Now extrapolating this to 2006, this grew by about 20% to 121,000 deaths a year and is now the sixth leading cause of death ahead of diabetes, Alzheimer's, influenza, and pneumonia. And so adverse drug reactions is an area where hopefully therapeutic drug monitoring can really play a role. So before I talk more about therapeutic drug monitoring, I have to provide a, a little bit of background and some key concepts. So pharmacokinetics describes the body's effect on a drug uh, involving the processes of absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. Pharmacodynamics describes the drug's effect on the body. So for example, the therapeutic effect of vasodilation for hypertension, uh, or in the case of penicillin uh, and an adverse rash, that could also be pharmacodynamics. And then pharmacogenetics is the study of inherited differences in drug effects. And for example, uh, in the media more recently with clopidogrel or Plavix, there is, are uh, differences with regards to cytochrome P450 2C19, where poor metabolizers, and this is uh, seen a lot in Asians, up to about 30% may be poor metabolizers, and then therefore not metabolize clopidogrel into the active drug, and uh, this is associated with worse cardiovascular outcomes. So what's needed for therapeutic drug monitoring to work, and what I'll refer to therapeutic drug monitoring uh, throughout this talk is TDM. So first is recognizing the concept that one drug, uh, one dose does not necessarily fit all patients. And so the goal is to provide individualized drug dosing to optimize patient safety and efficacy. What's needed, however, is a clinically meaningful range of drug concentrations, either in plasma or some other easily sampled matrix, um, that correlates with effect. And various conditions that uh, where TDM may benefit include drugs that have a narrow therapeutic range or index, uh, plasma, uh, drugs where plasma concentrations have a good correlation with drug efficacy or toxicity, uh, drugs that have unpredictable pharmacokinetics, so for example, uh, drugs that have nonlinear pharmacokinetics with increasing dose or that have high inter or intrapatient variability, and then also a fast, accurate, reproducible, precise, specific, and inexpensive drug assay hopefully uh, is available. So in the uh, various fields of medicine, therapeutic drug monitoring has become more routine and can have a large impact to improve outcomes. So for example, uh, in, with warfarin dosing, PT-INR is routinely measured, uh, as well as for monitoring phenytoin uh, concentrations to prevent seizures. Uh, in the area of oncology, there is a fine line between uh, efficacy and toxicity. And this is further compounded by the uh, increase in, in orally administered agents, which is great for patient convenience. However, it comes with its own challenges in terms of uh, variability between patients, drug-drug interactions, uh, as well as the need to make sure that patients are taking their medications um, because they're administered, if they're orally, often on an outpatient basis. So 
in, so with the advent of more uh, orally administered agents, this uh, provides a schematic of decreased concentrations or decreased bioavailability um, with oral agents. So for example, if you have 100% of a drug going in here through the stomach into the small intestine, then at the level of the enterocyte, you have multiple uh, enzymes such as the cytochrome P450 enzyme system that metabolizes drugs, decreasing the amounts that is available, as well as drug uh, transporters, such as P-glycoprotein, which uh, pump drug out, further decreasing the amount that then can be absorbed. And so if you have 100% going in, perhaps you may only have 50% that is then absorbed. So if you have 50% here going uh, into the portal vein to the liver, where at the level of the hepatocyte, then you have similar mechanisms that also decrease the amount of drug that is then further available to uh, systemically for activity. And so if you start out with 100%, you may only have 25% uh, available for activity. So for therapeutic drug monitoring, um, you have to first uh, determine what pharmacokinetic parameters are best associated with outcome. And so here we have a concentration versus time graph. Uh, where different pharmacokinetic parameters have uh, been associated with outcomes. So we have, they could, it could be uh, the maximum concentration or Cmax, also known as the peak overdosing interval, which is just the uh, highest concentration overdosing interval, uh, as in the case of aminoglycosides and aminoglycoside efficacy, as, as the, these drugs are uh, concentration dependent. Uh, also, you can have uh, the area under the curve, also known as the AUC, uh, or steady state concentration, abbreviated CSS, which is a reflection of the overall exposure. And for busulfan, AUC or CSS has been correlated with efficacy and toxicity, which I'll go over more in uh, a few slides. And then we also have uh, trough concentrations, which are just the concentration at the end of the dosing interval. And so aminoglycoside nephrotoxicity uh, has been associated with trough concentrations, vancomycin efficacy, and then protease inhibitor efficacy uh, as well. So first I'd like to talk about a drug that's been around for quite some time, uh, which my lab actually routinely quantifies both for clinical use as well as for different research protocols for over 75 different transplant centers around the nation. And so busulfan is a bifunctional alkylating agent, and how it's eliminated uh, is through liver metabolism, mainly through glutathione conjugation by glutathione S transferase. It was first synthesized back in the 50s, and then in the 70s it was uh, developed as a conditioning agent for use prior to bone marrow transplantation. And much of that uh, early developmental work was really pioneered uh, here at the University of Washington and at uh, Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center by Don Thomas and his team, where uh, for which his work, he was awarded the Nobel Prize back in 1990. And then so in the 90s, uh, busulfan became more widely used in combination with cyclophosphamide as a commonly used conditioning agent prior to stem cell transplantation. So some con considerations uh, in busulfan dosing are that um, patient specific, so with regard to age and weight, and then also um, concentrations in various compartments, so for example, the central nervous system. And busulfan actually gets into this area pretty well, uh, and concentrations in the cerebral spinal fluid approximate that in the plasma. Uh, concentration, so busulfan exposure has been uh, correlated with graft rejection and relapse, and both seem to be increased as busulfan exposures decrease. Uh, various drug interactions also can have a dramatic impact on busulfan concentrations. For example, metronidazole can uh, increase 
uh, concentrations of busulfan by up to 80%. And then two uh, common and significant toxicities that have been associated with busulfan include both acute and late pulmonary toxicity, uh, which was dose limiting from phase one studies, and then also sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, SOS, also referred to as venoclusive uh, disease, which has been associated with uh, higher exposures greater than 1500 micromolar minute. So sinusoidal obstruction syndrome uh, and venoocclusive disease um, in the literature can occur in about 20% of patients after bone marrow transplantation and is fatal in up to 50% of cases. So it's a, it's a significant issue. Um, it's associated depending on the uh, actual conditioning regimen that's used and is a dose limiting toxicity for high dose busulfan as well as in combination with other agents. So the goal of um, therapeutic drug monitoring or in the case of busulfan targeting where it's been termed pharmacotherapy directed therapy. So here we see the number of patients uh, on the y-axis and then drug exposure on the x-axis. And what we really want um, is the major majority of patients to be within this therapeutic window in the case of busulfan with myeloablation and relatively few people on either side with disease progression due to low levels or organ toxicity due to high levels. So the variability of busulfan exposures is actually pretty large. And so the original formulation was uh, an, oral, an orally administered drug uh, that was dosed one milligram per kilo. And then, so for AUC's interpatient variability would vary, can vary up to about 61%. And then uh, clearance, which is a measure of busulfan elimination and uh, involves the relationship between the actual dose that was administered as well as the resulting exposure and is corrected for the patient's weight uh, is also quite variable with coefficients of variation up to 50%. Um, more recently, the, an intravenous uh, form of busulfan was developed by uh, researchers at MD Anderson and University of Houston to try to overcome the issue seen with oral busulfan. And the variability is a little bit lower. Uh, however, it is still variable um, and it is a lot more expensive. So I'd like to go over some studies that help to define the um, influence of busulfan exposure on outcome and toxicity. So this is one of the first and larger um, studies that first sought to define the exposure threshold. And what they uh, did was they looked at 66 patients with various hematologic malignancies who were receiving an oral busulfan uh, conditioning regimen in combination with cyclophosphamide over four uh, consecutive days f every six hours for a total of 16 doses. And what these uh, investigators did was measure the concentrations for during the first dose of busulfan. And if you look here, we have a total of 66 patients, but actually uh, only 51 patients had a, a valuable data because of either slow absorption or uh, very slow elimination where they were not able to determine uh, abusulfan exposure using the, the samples that they did collect. So out of 51 valuable patients, 35% had their um, AUC or busulfan exposure that was higher than the uh, a priori defined threshold of high toxicity doses uh, or high exposure of 1500 micromolar minute. And so 12 out of 66 patients, so 18%, did develop VOD. And if we break this down by the AUC, you can see that there was a relationship where in patients with AUC exposures greater than 1,500, 33% developed VOD compared to only 3% who had exposures less than 1,500. So the risk of developing VOD in 
those who had AUCs greater than 1,500 was 11 times higher compared to those who had uh, exposures less than that. And so this was one of the first studies that helped to define uh, the upper limit of exposure in patients who were receiving busulfan and cyclophosphamide conditioning. So John Slattery and colleagues here at uh, UW and Fred Hutch also pre performed a retrospective analysis of 45 patients <coughs> with uh, chronic myeloid leukemia who were receiving busulfan and cyclophosphamide um, prior to transplantation. And what they found was that uh, in patients with steady state exposures less than the median of 917 nanograms per mil. And so these numbers, the CSS and the AUC can be <coughs> used interchangeably, um, and this res corresponds to an AUC of 1340. So what they found was that in those with exposures less than 917 nanograms per mil, this was an associ associated with an increased risk of relapse for CML. Uh, seven patients developed persistent cytogenetic uh, relapse, and three of these patients died, and all of them were in uh, patients with CSS exposures less than 917, and no patients relapsed who had uh, exposures of greater than that. So this study also uh, helped to further develop and refine the exposure threshold, but this was in CML, so uh, they found that concentrations were associated with an increased risk of relapse if they were too low. Uh, Anderson and colleagues at MD Anderson, they also uh, performed a prospective study looking at um, patients with CML, and here they used the intravenous formulation of busulfan. And what they did was they were looking to see uh, what was there an association or influence of busulfan exposure on uh, survival. And what they found was that in this study, 11 patients uh, died. And looking at this, this graph and the risk of, uh, risk of death, what they found was that there was this uh, interval where patients who were within an AUC of 950 to 1520, which is a CSS of 650 to 1040, had a lower uh, risk of death or increased survival time if they were between these exposures. And so in the last 11 patients, they actually prospectively uh, would measure concentrations and then adjust their concentrations or their dose to target within this interval if they were outside of that. And then uh, finally, this is one of the late last studies that I'll talk about for busulfan. And what uh, Argawa and colleagues from the University of Alabama did was they uh, looked at 49 patients with intermediate and high risk uh, non Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma. And they looked more retrospectively uh, at one group at, who received just the standard oral um, dose with no pharmacokinetic uh, monitoring, and then, it, which was a historical comparison. Um, and then after 1999, where they started using intravenous uh, busulfan, and in patients who had both IV as well as pharmacokinetic directed therapy, and so they monitored dose one exposures, and they targeted an AUC between 1,000 to 1,500 uh, micromolar, micromolar minute, which is equal to a CSS of 600 and roughly uh, 680 to uh, a little bit over 1,000. And what they found was that progression-free survival actually was significantly higher uh, at 50% compared to 17% in those who did receive both the intravenous therapy with uh, pharmacokinetic-directed therapy.
as well as non-relapse mortality was significantly lower in the IV PK directed group at 3% compared to 28% in those who just received standard oral therapy. So these studies really help to show how uh, you know, various researchers and a lot of work help to define the uh, exposure thresholds in a variety of disease states uh, for using and for supporting use of routine therapeutic drug monitoring to help improve outcomes uh, with busulfan. However, more data are actually still needed to further refine these thresholds uh, in different disease states using uh, different conditioning regimens. Um, and so I've put busulfan kind of as a model, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about you know, something that I've spent a lot of time working on uh, in my past training, and something I'm still uh, very interested in regarding HIV AIDS, where um, therapeutic drug monitoring isn't quite as well developed, but I think there are definitely areas where uh, it can be very important. And so HIV AIDS is um, a disease that affects more uh, than 1 million individuals in the U.S. and nearly 40 million worldwide. Uh, highly active antiretroviral therapy has significantly decreased morbidity and mortality. Drug interactions really play a critical role uh, in this area. And with HIV, as many patients uh, are on at least three medications for HIV treatment, uh, the many are also immunosuppressed, requiring more medications for prophylaxis of opportunistic infections. Uh, they often have other disease states, such as hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, requiring more medications. Uh, the antiretrovirals cause a lot of adverse effects as well, so requiring even more medications for symptomatic relief. Not to mention the fact that many of these patients are also taking over-the-counter drugs and herbal products and may not tell you about them because they don't really think of these as medications and, and often view them just as safe because, you know, you can just go into the store and buy them. So this is really an area where I think that uh, therapeutic drug monitoring can play a large role. And in terms of really understanding what's uh, at play here. So now there are actually 22 medications that are FDA approved for HIV treatment. And before we, uh, you know, when you're approaching this, you really need to think about uh, different considerations within all of these medications. And so now there are five classes of drugs. Uh, nucleoside, nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors, for example, zidovudine and tenofovir, where um, you know, extracellular as well as intracellular uh, concentrations are really important just because for these agents, you can measure plasma concentrations. However, because they actually have to be uh, activated intracellularly, then that makes things more complicated uh, because it's really the intracellular concentrations that are active. Uh, Non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, so for example, nevirapine and efavirenz, uh, these agents are metabolized by the cytochrome P450 enzyme system, but then they also induce and inhibit this enzyme system as well. Uh, and are substrates for drug transporters. The protease inhibitors, for example, ritonavir, lapinavir, and atazanavir, these agents also have similar considerations where they're metabolized by that enzyme system, but yet induce and inhibit it as well, as well as our substrates induce and inhibit various drug transporters. The two newest classes of drugs, so the entry inhibitors and the integrase inhibitors, um, also have a lot of considerations. So for the entry inhibitors, there's infuvertide and maraviroc. Uh, these agents can be metabolized by cytochrome P450 and are substrates for the drug transporters, as in the case of maraviroc, or in the case of infuvertide, uh, are just amino, is broken down by amino acid catabolism. So that luckily has relatively few drug interactions. And then the only uh, integrase inhibitor available right now is raltecrevir, and that one is metabolized by uh, uridine diphospho 
glucuronosyl transferase, also known as UGT. So for the remaining part of my talk, what I'll focus on is lopinavir ritonavir. And so this is a fixed dose protease inhibitor combination, and it's made up of these two protease inhibitors. It received FDA approval back in 2000, so nearly 10 years now. And this, this combination is interesting in that uh, lopinavir is the active agent. And ritonavir, although it does have HIV activity, it's actually used uh, in low concentrations and at a low dose to inhibit the cytochrome P450 enzyme system, specifically 3A, in order to achieve concentrations uh, of lopinavir that are necessary for HIV inhibition. So here, looking at some in vitro data, uh, we have lopinavir, ritonavir on the left and ritonavir on your right. And these uh, numbers at the top are concentrations that are typically achieved using clinical doses of uh, lopinavir, ritonavir. So maximum concentrations are about uh, 15 or 16 micromolar, trough concentrations about nine. And then ritonavir concentrations are much lower, so less than 0.7 micromolar, which is consistent with its uh, use. So if we look at um, the effects of lopinavir, ritonavir, and the IC50s on various cytochrome P450 enzymes. So here for 3A, the IC50, which is the concentration at which 50% of the uh, enzyme activity is inhibited, inhibited we expect that um, 3A would be inhibited based on these clinical concentrations and these IC50s. Uh, for 2D6 and 2C9, these concentrations are at the higher end of the, what's clinically achieved, so these may also be affected. But then for 2C19 and 2B6, because concentrations uh, are typically lower than the IC50s, we don't expect uh, any activity or inhibition there. In terms of P glycoprotein, lopinavir, ritonavir is a substrate and inhibitor. Uh, upon acute exposure, it looks like it inhibits, but then after prolonged exposure, so greater than 72 hours, it appears to induce P glycoprotein uh, activity. And so these are in vitro uh, data, but the thing is, is that a lot of times in vivo, what happens in vivo does not uh, reflect what, and it can't be easily predicted by uh, this in vitro data. So regarding lopinavir uh, variability, many antiretrovirals are actually highly have highly variable concentrations. And so here in this graph on your uh, left, you actually can see, um, so lopinavir or tonavir can be dosed either once or twice daily, and coefficients of variation uh, between patients are quite high with once daily dosing as you have higher peak concentrations and lower trough concentrations. So CV percents are about at 93%. Um, and then for twice daily dosing, it's a little bit lower, but still uh, quite variable. Uh, for intrapatient variability, um, a group from Johns Hopkins actually performed an intensive evaluation of HIV positive subjects who were stable on therapy for at least 11 months and who um, came in three times a week to the clinic uh, and had blood drawn three times a week for 36 visits over three to four months. And they were looking to get an idea of intrapatient variability. And so in these four patients who were on lopinavir, ritonavir, and they did make sure that patients would come in to the clinic at the same time uh, for each visit. They monitored what medications they were on. Uh, they would also ask about dietary and food restrictions because that can also affect concentrations and their adherence was very high at over 99%. So even in this 
highly, uh, highly, I guess, uh, I don't know how to say it better, but this, this group of patients who were really um, adherent to their medications, who you know, followed a strict regimen, they had quite a bit of variability in terms of their uh, concentration. So CV percents range between 24 to 92% in this group. So however, even though concentrations for uh, HIV drugs and lopinavir specifically can, is very highly variable. However, the, what's more important per se is, you know, how does the drug work? What's the response? And so for viral response in antiretroviral naive patients, um, it's actually very good despite this variability. And so here uh, in this, this, on this side, uh, lopinavir, ritonavir, using a, a dual nucleoside or nucleotide uh, backbone regimen, was able to uh, suppress patients virologically, so getting their viral loads less than 50 copies um, per ml consistently um, in a group of patients and consistently over multiple uh, prospective randomized studies at about 76 to 77 percent uh, maintaining uh, undetectable levels. And for this particular agent as well, there's data, published data up to seven years where they, 61, 59 percent, uh, maintained undetectable levels for seven years. And so, you know, despite the fact that the concentrations may be relatively variable, the response, which is, you know, the important thing and has been uh, correlated with improved survival as well as uh, immunologic recovery, is very good. So here, because of this, it's very difficult in this population um, to routinely recommend uh, therapeutic drug monitoring. However, for certain populations where uh, effect may not be as, uh, as predictable, that's really where therapeutic drug monitoring uh, in HIV may play a large role. And so some of these groups would be uh, patients who have, don't have any viral response despite having a really good, having really good adherence. Uh, those who have hepatic or renal dysfunction due to the fact that these drugs are eliminated that way, uh, pregnancy, the pediatric population as um, these patients uh, or these individuals uh, have their drug disposition mechanisms changing very frequently um, and it's often difficult to enforce their adherence patients with different complicated drug-drug interactions, and then those who have seen a lot of different HIV agents who are on very complicated regimens, and then also uh, individuals who uh, may have toxicity or adverse effects that may be associated with drug concentrations. So, here are some examples of um, in vivo interactions with lopinavir or ritonavir. So lopinavir is a cytochrome P453A substrate. Uh, ritonavir is a potent 3A inhibitor. So based on what we see in vitro, some of these uh, changes are expected. So these are various 3A substrates, so rifabutin, sequinavir, indinavir, and Although it's a, the impact is pretty variable, uh, it's consistent, meaning that we expect 3A to be inhibited and we see exposures of these other 3A substrates and we see them and they do increase. However, there are other drugs that are also purported 3A <coughs> substrates, but yet their exposures when given with lopinavir or aren't what we expect. So methadone exposures decreased by 53%, ethinyl estradiol decreased, norethandrone decreased, and the reason for these later effects are uh, unclear. In clinical studies, uh, dasipramine, which is a 2D6 substrate, did not show any uh, changes in exposure when given with lopinavir ritonavir.
So drug interactions with uh, this agent, there's a high potential for drug interactions. Predicting these interactions isn't straightforward, and because there is this fixed dose combination, it changes the dose-response relationships, and then enzyme induction or inhibition of a single agent isn't equivalent to the combination. So what I'd like to highlight are some studies that uh, we did at UNC. And so here we have uh, lopinavir ritonavir that was given in combination with phenytoin. And this was a study done in uh, healthy volunteers. And so Angela Kashuba's group in North Carolina, what they looked at was uh, concentrations of lopinavir and concentrations of ritonavir given when in combination after steady state dosing of lopinavir, ritonavir, and phenytoin. And because phenytoin is a potent 3A inducer, we expect to see concentrations of lopinavir and concentrations of ritonavir decrease. And that's what we saw um, there and there. So that is concentrations of lopinavir. So prior to um, being given with phenytoin, and then here in these open triangles are concentrations of lopinavir after phenytoin. So they decreased by about 30%. And this is also seen with ritonavir. However, what was unexpected is these are concentrations of phenytoin. And so phenytoin, this is by itself in the dark uh, circles, and then in the open triangles, phenytoin in combination with lopinavir, ritonavir. And so concentrations of phenytoin also decreased, which was completely unexpected. And so phenytoin is metabolized by 2C9, which also metabolizes warfarin, uh, and then to a lesser extent, 2C19, which, is, which also metabolizes omeprazole. So, you know, what's going on there? And so uh, a cocktail approach uh, has been used for more than 20 years. And what this is is using two or more uh, drugs that usually have some sort of clean uh, metabolic pathway. So using these in combinations uh, to evaluate drug metabolizing enzyme activity, drug transporter activity. Uh, so they can be used to evaluate degree of uh, renal and hepatic dysfunction, uh, phenotype, drug metabolizing enzymes, and then better characterize uh, enzyme inhibition or induction for uh, certain agents. So one cocktail uh, that has quite a bit of data to support it, and various drugs are used as uh, probes, and the FDA has a list of uh, preferred agents. And so of the preferred agents, uh, this cocktail has been validated. So it involves using midazolam to uh, phenotype or to evaluate 3A, dextromethorphan to evaluate 2D6, caffeine to evaluate 1A2, N-acetyltransferase 2, and xanthine oxidase omeprazole to evaluate 2C19, and then warfarin in combination with vitamin K to um, counter the risk for um, PTINR issues and bleeding effects uh, to phenotype 2C9. So what, um, this was a study that I did um, back when I was in Chapel Hill uh, to kind of answer that question as why did we see that unexpected effect on phenytoin? And so looking at 3A activity, uh, we gave healthy volunteers IV midazolam, so before and then after 10 days of lopinavir ritonavir at clinically used doses. And what we found was a fourfold decrease in midazolam clearance, which reflects uh, a fourfold decrease in hepatic 3A activity. We also gave these same individuals oral midazolam and found an even greater decrease in uh, oral midazolam clearance of 14-fold, which correlates with a 14-fold decrease in, uh, in gut and hepatic 3A activity.
So this is consistent with what we expect, and so lopinavir ritonavir inhibits 3A. For evaluating 2C9, we actually looked at the omeprazole metabolic ratio, uh, looking at the ratio between omeprazole, which is the parent, and then 5-hydroxyomeprazole, which is the metabolite uh, using this 2C19 pathway at two hours. And here what you can see is that the ratio actually significantly decreased um, by about 72%. And this reflects a 72% increase in 2C19 activity after taking lopinavir ritonavir. So there was an induction effect going on. Uh, for 2C9, we gave individuals uh, warfarin and evaluated S-warfarin because that is the um, component that is metabolized by 2C9. And so concentrations of uh, S-warfarin actually decreased after receiving lopinavir ritonavir for 10 days by about 27%. And this also reflects induction of 2C9. So what we found was that um, there was a 72% induction of 2C19, a uh, 27% induction of 2C9, and then fourfold hepatic inhibition and then 14-fold intestinal and hepatic 3A uh, inhibition. So increased dosage of drugs metabolized primarily by 2C19 and possibly by 2C9 pathways may be necessary for optimal management when given concomitantly with lopinavir ritonavir. Um, this results in moderate hepatic and strong intestinal inhibition of 3A. And then the decrease in exposure of some 3A substrates, as we saw a few slides before, is actually likely due to induction of drug metabolizing enzymes, transporters, or protein binding interactions. And so back to the reason why we did that study. So lopinavir uh, and ritonavir are metabolized by 3A. Phenytoin is metabolized by 2C9 and 2C19. Phenytoin uh, actually induces, as we know from previous work, 3A, and so the concentrations that decrease of lopinavir and ritonavir are expected. So what happened using the cocktail study that we did was that lopinavir and ritonavir actually induces 2C9 and 2C19, and these metabolize phenytoin, resulting in the decreased concentrations that we saw. So now the, this interaction is actually a little bit more clear. Um, another area that I'd like to spend a little bit of time on where therapeutic drug monitoring can uh, play a role in HIV-infected patients is during pregnancy. So during pregnancy, there are so many changes going on, uh, and they really do affect pharmacokinetics. So there's altered gastrointestinal function, um, an increased volume of distribution as the total body water increases by about eight liters. Uh, body fat stores also increase. There are alterations in drug binding proteins. And then there are also alterations in drug metabolism. So progesterone can uh, induce different drug metabolizing enzymes. And then uh, other progesterone and estrogen may also compete for drug binding sites, which then may alter uh, drug metabolism. So because of these pharmacokinetic changes, um, protease inhibitors, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors can uh, be uh, affected and have decreased concentrations during pregnancy. The, uh, this, and this risks increased uh, incomplete viral suppression, uh, development of resistance, and then also increases the risk for perinatal transmission. So Steck and colleagues, what they did was look at a standard dose of lopinavir ritonavir in HIV-infected pregnant women during the third trimester and also 6 to uh, 12 weeks postpartum. And what they wanted to see, and they used a target exposure of 
52 microgram hours per mil, which was the 10th percentile in a cohort of uh, HIV-infected non-pregnant women. And they found that during the third trimester, only 18% of women met this exposure target, which was actually quite low. Uh, and then comparing the exposures before and after um, pregnancy, they found that during the third trimester, exposures were only 72% of what was seen postpartum using the same dose. And here they did do um, full exposure curve, so lopinavir, ritonavir is dosed every 12 hours, and so they did give an observed dose and sample over that 12 hours. And then what, in response to this in follow-up, Moroshnik and colleagues, they looked a little bit earlier. So they looked beginning the second trimester of pregnancy, uh, also at the third and postpartum, but here instead of six to 12 weeks postpartum, they actually uh, did pharmacokinetic sampling a little bit earlier, so two weeks postpartum. And what they used the same exposure target, which is shown here in this blue line, and then this upper uh, line is the 50th percentile. And so in the second trimester, they gave the same, just the regular dose of lopinavir, ritonavir, uh, and found that about 63% met the exposure target, which isn't bad. Um, and what they did, because in the previous study, we know that concentrations and exposures decrease beginning in the third trimester. So they actually gave a higher dose beginning the third trimester. So instead of just three capsules twice daily, they gave four capsules twice daily. And, it, and what happened was that 81% actually did meet the exposure target. Uh, and then postpartum, 96% met the exposure target. But what you can see is that concentrations postpartum are nearly double of what they are during the third trimester. So this suggests that um, by two weeks postpartum, the effects of, the, of pregnancy on lapinavir, ritonavir are actually uh, resolved. So um, here what is suggested is that beginning during the third trimester, an increased dose of lapinavir ritonavir is used. However, um, this older formulation has different problems in that it has to be refrigerated, it has to be taken with food. Um, so a newer formulation is now available and is the only one that's available. So, um, and this is the tablet formulation. So it's not completely certain of these results will translate to the current formulation, but um, I do know that a group in Chapel Hill, they did just finish uh, a study looking at the current formulation in pregnant women, and um, hopefully results will be presented this fall. So in conclusion, um, certain drugs have high inter and intra patient variability. Uh, relationships with drug exposures and clinical outcomes as they become more delineated um, really help to support use of therapeutic drug monitoring and therapeutic uh, drug monitoring as personalized medicine can have a significant impact. So at this point, uh, I'd like to conclude and thank you for your attention. Questions? Dan? Hey, Rosa, thank you for uh, coming giving this talk. Um, could you just briefly explain how you actually go about calculating the area under the curve for something like Busulfan? Mm -hmm. So, um, busulfan is a little bit more complicated in terms of calculating, but I guess in general, so we have a drug and we give an observed dose. Um, how you calculate an exposure is dependent on a few things because you have to think about the pharmacokinetics of that drug. Uh, so is it given orally? Is it given intravenously? And then also, what's the half-life of the drug? Which reflects and which will determine how long you actually measure drug concentrations. So for example, busulfan, um, it, it can be given either orally or intravenously. So in the example of 
it being administered orally, which is usually what we do at the SCCA because oral B sulfan is so much less expensive than the IV formulation, although it is so variable, we do have very good data uh, to support giving oral B sulfam. And so we give it, we administer it, um, the, that time, the exact time is documented. Blood is taken over several time points after that uh, observed dose. And so for busulfan, we actually, and because it's usually given every six hours, so then we actually sample for six hours. Uh, we run the concentrations in the lab. And so in our lab, uh, there's various technologies that quantitate busulfan, uh, gas chromatography with mass spec spectrometry, um, also liquid chromatography with mass spec. We actually use the GCMS technology. Um, we quantitate the, the drug concentrations in the individual samples. And then we use two different methods. So because you're measuring concentrations over say six hours. You actually just use the trapezoidal method. So you draw a line between you know, each concentration with that time interval and you add the, those blocks up. I mean, it's, it's very rudimentary and simple, but that's over the time period that you observe. However, if you're not at steady state for a dose, like for example, the first dose of busulfan or any drug that you're given, you actually want to um, estimate not just what you see, but the amount that uh, is resulting from that dose, if that makes any sense. Because if you take one dose and you only observe after six hours, you'll see an exposure. However, that doesn't mean the drug is completely gone. You still have this tail end that your body is still continuing to eliminate, but you're not measuring because, I mean, you can't keep the patient there for <laughs> A week. Uh, I mean, I guess you could, but you prob the patient probably would not like to do that, and you may not want to do that either. Um, so then what you end up doing is you will see an elimination curve, and that is a straight line. And so you just take that slope, and then you multiply it out to infinity. So it's kind of a long-winded version of how to say it, but that's how we determine the exposure. So do you say that um, that you do busulfan testing for other uh, as a, a uh, as a reference uh, lab mm -hmm. for other centers? Mm -hmm. So how how does that work pra uh, practically speaking? I mean, imagine that you know it takes some time to get the samples, and then you've got to get the results back to them. Is that um, is is there a reason that it needs to be done in one lab, or or, or um, is it just impractical for, for multiple centers to do this? Is it is it very and and how and how does that work? Can you comment on that? Um, that's a good question. I mean, there are probably about seventeen different labs around the nation that do quantitate busulfan, but you know there are a lot of transplant centers, smaller transplant centers. I don't think it's necessarily feasible to fully develop an assay, have the staff required to turn around that assay because busulfan is only given for four days four consecutive days. So you have this time interval that you need to have a very fast, reliable um, assay. And you have to have the, you know, the staffing to turn it around within, ideally, that same day that you get the samples. That way you have as much time as possible. If concentrations are too low or too high, then you can adjust it to establish that uh, ideal effect. Um, so the centers that send us samples, um, they usually don't have, uh, you know, on-site assay available. And so either they can use, you know, a, another lab that may be closer to them. But I think through our long history of quantitating busulfan, which has been going on for over 10 years, you know, way before I got here. And so our, I think, history, uh, as well as the fact that we have excellent outcomes at the Hutch and at SCC and at UW, uh, that really helps to support centers sending us their samples. And so they'll, you know, obviously uh, send it on dry ice, uh, send it overnight, we get it in the morning, and then 
we can turn around the samples, report the drug concentrations, report the AUC exposure, and provide a dose recommendation within four hours after sample arrival. And are there, are there predictors for, um, for uh, bucelfet metabolism? I mean, is, is, is that understood, or is, is there a standard dose that everyone's, everyone starts with and then you and manipulate it from there? there? There's no way to predict it. Right now, there aren't good predictors. Um, people do start out with essentially the same dose, although there are dosing nomograms, especially for pediatrics who have higher busulfan clearances. Um, there are genetic polymorphisms in uh, glutathione S-transferase, which metabolizes busulfan. However, those relationships are not clearly defined. And you know, even if you are, say, a poor metabolizer or have a variant allele, it doesn't necessarily correlate yet uh, well with uh, busulfan clearance, unfortunately. So. Great. Well, are there any other questions? When you're adjusting these doses of busulfan and you're using oral stuff, how do you make fine-tuning adjustments with oral doses? It's limited based on the amount of busulfan, and so it's available in two milligram tablets. So we can adjust in increments of two milligrams.